Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends, good afternoon and welcome to the closing session of the 26th World Economic Forum on ASEAN, where the co-chairs have joined me to discuss their key takeaways from the discussions of the last few days. By way of introduction, to my immediate left here is President Chin, President of the Asia, Asian In Infrastructure Investment Bank from China. Uh, to his left is Hui Ling, co-founder of Grab, Southeast Asia's leading on-demand mobile platform. To her left is Wolfgang Jaman, Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of CARE International, one of the world's leading humanitarian organizations. Kun Thevan, Chief Executive Officer, PTT, from Thailand, and John Rice, Vice Chairman, General Electric. Thank you all for joining us today. So uh, we've spent a few days at this meeting, and the theme of the meeting is Youth, Technology, and Growth, Securing ASEAN's Digital and Demographic Dividend. Uh, the discussions span many different topics, but across three different major areas, ASEAN in the new global context, ASEAN and the Connectivity Agenda, and ASEAN and the Youth Agenda. We talked about youth quite a bit, uh, and although ASEAN is turning 50 this year, the population is extremely young, in fact, the youngest, I believe, in Asia, and only one in six ASEAN citizens was even alive when the bloc was formed. So not only does the region abound with youth, but it's also benefited greatly and growing rap from the rapid growth of the digital economy and the access to internet. Um, we had deliberations on many different topics from infrastructure, power, education, jobs, connectivity, trade, and also how the region can actually harness the potential of the young demographic and the transformative impact of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, the forum is also very pleased that this uh, time, for the first time, we were able to have an opportunity to interact with over 2,500 students, uh, Cambodian students, at the open forum to debate the critical issues that will shape the Asian uh, or ASEAN dream. And obviously, these individuals will be pretty key to, um, to what the future has to bring. So it was a special opportunity, and uh, we are pleased to report that the session was actually viewed live by over 120,000 people, and it was shared more than 1,800 times and generated over 2,700 comments on the forum's Facebook page. So that's always helpful when you're uh, talking to young people. That tends to happen. Uh, but coming back to the co-chairs here and their key takeaways, um, I would like to ask each of you to take a few minutes to share with us um, as you reflect on the key learnings and insights from the last few days, what do you feel is the most important uh, and possibly urgent priority to secure that digital and demographic dividend that we've been talking about? So I might start here with President Shin. Thank you very much. Uh, we in AIIB are very much supportive of the uh, economic and social progress in ASEAN countries, and we have a pretty big team uh, attending this meeting. As a multilateral development finance institution, with ASEAN countries as a group of the first countries joining in setting up this bank, we are very proud of the ASEAN countries' strong support for a new multilateral development bank. Our job is to, to work with you and to promote uh, investment in infrastructure and other productive sectors. The priority for this region, in my view, is the continued uh, commitment to the development around the, three, uh, around the themes of use, uh, technology, and growth, which is, I think, very much fitting for this region. And uh, the infrastructure investment is very much important because it paves the path for sustained growth. But we highlight the importance of having smart infrastructure, which means infrastructure is built, designed in a smart way, and be operated in a smart way. I believe a balanced approach to infrastructure development alongside the social uh, objectives will bring ASEAN countries to 
to the next stage of development, and I, I echo the uh, leaders' uh, dreams in this region. You will be moving quickly into middle-income countries, even high middle-income countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yuling, um, you know, I, I have to ask you whether about um, what you might think about the region becoming a key hub for new entrepreneurial efforts sort of based on your uh, key takeaways and what you might also, based on some of these key takeaways, think about as opportunities for other players who may come to bear. Yeah, so I think everything that I've heard over the past two, three days shows one shared thing, which is there is a significant ton of opportunity and there is a significant ton of optimism on what we can do and that what we have been doing is in the right direction. What we need to do is continue evolving and emphasizing that growth. In terms of your specific question of what the future looks like for technology, young startups, uh, how we can shape that, I think that that's completely in line with my takeaways from what are the key priorities? My point of view, of course, as the representative of the youth and the technology se sector is to understand that we all have a different role and part to play. Um, I think I was very fortunate to sit in some conversations where I realized that there's so many different factors that lead into the growth and evolution of ASEAN, the countries, whether it's geopolitical, um, whether it's around security, whether it's around trade, these are all very important questions, and I trust that the many leaders that we have have these discussions in good, good hands. But when I think about what you know, individuals like myself can do, what Grab can do, what the people that we are hiring can continue to do, I think about, hey, what is the future of Southeast Asia look, going to look like? And how do we think it should be evolving? Each of us need to understand that we equally hold the future of ASEAN in our hands, and we should be actively shaping it. Um, I don't have any specifics of what everybody should be doing, but what I would love to do, if I can encourage my fellow younger generation and millennials to do, is to understand that there is a ton of uh, openness, and a lot of folks are asking us to play a bigger role, and we should. It's a great opportunity. Uh, and we should leverage it. The most important thing is, beyond discussions, we should go and take action. And that's what I hope to continue doing for the next year to 50. Thank you. Wolfgang, you certainly bring the civil society vo voice to this panel and to the meeting. What, from your standpoint, are the key priorities? Well, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to attend, I think, a very exciting two and a half days. Uh, I've been quite inspired by the diversity of perspectives, uh, opinions, uh, views, and of course the opportunities that, that come with uh, that diversity. Um, and I hope that this diversity kind of comes together to uh, a picture, the pieces of a puzzle. Now, when I look at maybe an overriding narrative that I heard, and which is slightly different probably from some of the other regional summits or even the annual summit of, um, of uh, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, is. And there's been a lot of focus on economic prosperity, on the dividend, on the growth opportunities. And, you know, no surprise, this is a, a potent region. Um, but the second part of the narrative, of course, was inclusivity. And uh, the Honorable Prime Minister talked about it yesterday, and we had a lot of people in various panels use that word, inclusive growth, inclusivity. But maybe one of the shortcomings um, is that we're not very concrete about what we mean. And I think it's a great term. And uh, to translate that into what some of the colleague, one, one colleague from Tata said yesterday, is the business of business is beyond business. So we have a wider ambition. And how is that ambition going to translate into reaching those who run into the trouble of being left behind? So inclusivity must not just stop at connecting rural areas or reaching the underserved or the underbanked. We have to have a bigger ambition. We have to have an ambition to reach those who are really marginalized. And from the perspective of care, you know, there, there are many women in particular who are under very, very fragile and difficult uh, work situations, labor situations, subject to all kinds of hazards, including uh, gender-based violence. 
but we've also heard from other countries, you know, the struggles that ethnic and un other minorities have in, in terms of being included in the opportunities of this region. So my plea would be to be more ambitious when it comes to inclusivity and to be more specific because we want to improve not just the state of the world, as the World Economic Forum is saying, but also the state of the entire region. Thank you. Uh, Kun Tevin, you represent a key economy within the ASEAN region, and of course the region has embarked on the new economic integration. So with that in view and perspective, what would you prioritize as important elements for ASEAN to focus on? Right. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to reflect on the uh, session mainly on an energy first, and then I'll go to the youth sure. and technology later on. Uh, but on the energy, uh, we are in, seems to be in the mode of the transition uh, from the uh, old economy into innovation, uh, from molecules supply into the uh, internal combustion engine into the electrons going to electric cars and uh, solar power. Uh, so uh, allow me to use a few words, key words that was used in the uh, industrial session. I think we talk about the holy grail of energy security, uh, which comprises three factors, the affordability, the uh, uh, accessibility, and also the sustainability of energy would be key to, to fuel the growth of ASEAN. Uh, ideal energy, we discussed a little bit about what would be the appropriate energy mix uh, between the fossil fuel and the, all the renewable or alternative energies. And uh, so we start looking at the, the ideal energy characteristics. And uh, the ideal uh, characteristic would be uh, you need to have abundance uh, of that energy. Uh, it has to be cheap, affordable. Uh, it has to be safe for the users, for the consumers. Also, it has to be pollu pollution-free or minimum impact on the environment. And also, it has to provide the continuity and dependable. So all these are ideal factors, five factors. Of course, you're not going to get all of these five from one single energy source. So sometimes you have to trade off uh, among the, this. And it depends on the, each individual uh, economy or countries to look into their own uh, stocks, whether they have available resources, whether they have technology or infrastructure, uh, which would allow them to select a proper uh, energy mix portfolio of their own countries. But in any case, uh, one of the key themes of the energy would be the connectivity, and that would enable uh, the country among ASEAN to help each other in providing that holy grail of energy security to each other. So the connectivity would be the key. Now to, uh, to support the connectivity and as well as to support the direction of energy mix, the government need to look into the uh, available resources, technology and infrastructure and so on, and come up with a certain policy and, and regulations that would be a driver to uh, go to that energy mix that would be desirable and optimum for that, uh, that country. Uh, so the regulatory would need to be the enablers and, and not the uh, uh, obstacles in development of the uh, energy. And especially for the connectivity, we talk about cross-border regulatory. Uh, so far, it seems to be one of the obstacles because uh, the cross-flow of energy uh, through the boundary, so far, it's been uh, uh, a, a challenge because of the regulatory in each country will not allow or permit that to, to do that uh, very effectively. Just a quick touch on the uh, youth and technology. Uh, uh, several of the sessions went through the, uh, the skills and the education required for the new generation in order to keep up with the, the technology, with the artificial intelligence and the disruptive technology that is being developed. And it seems like the uh, traditional education would need to be reviewed and revised into innovative uh, education. The cognitive ability uh, would be something that uh, artificial intelligence may require some time to catch up with human. Uh, single skill may have to be changed into multiple skill uh, for developing our young generation. And as well as in the formal education, we need to uh, provide uh, the environment ecosystem for our young generation to think rather than to know because now you can search anything 
in the Googles. So thank you very much. Thank you. And John, from your perspective, you of course bring in both a global and a regional view to this, so I'm curious to hear your key takeaways. Well, thank you very much, and Excellencies, thank you for allowing us all to have the opportunity to be here. You know, I think about this past two days and our experience more broadly in, in ASEAN and around the world, I think about two words, progress and opportunity. Uh, the fact that we're here in Phnom Penh is a reflection of the tremendous progress that's been made over the past few decades. When I look at ASEAN in the 50th year, I think about progress, tremendous progress, really in, in every country. And that leads us to a world full of opportunities. You know, there is no region, in my view, in the world that has better opportunities than the ASEAN region. But it doesn't come without some challenge, and it doesn't come without the need to address some very fundamental requirements. Uh, the op we won't be successful in capitalizing or realizing those opportunities unless we provide for sustainable economic growth, inclusive, so that everybody benefits from the rising tide. In an increasingly digital world, it's so easy for people to compare what they have with what others have, and when they don't like the comparison, they have lots of different ways to voice their displeasure. That affects countries and it affects companies. So this idea that there must be sustainable, inclusive growth really is much more than an idea. It is an imperative. So we have to create the jobs, but we have to create the jobs for the 21st century a more digital world, not the jobs for the 20th century or the 19th century. And these have to be jobs that can exist in a world that doesn't always recognize the importance of globalization or global trade. So one of the things, and it's been a theme in a number of the discussions that I've been involved in over the last couple of days, is how do you fight back in a world that thinks globalization has become a bad word? There's no region that has benefited more from interregional interactions than ASEAN. The progress in these countries has occurred because there's, there's collaboration, connection, and trade that goes back and forth, not just within the region, but more broadly. We have to make sure that people don't forget about that. The other point that we talked about yesterday was the importance of ensuring that borders don't become barriers, but become points of connection, where electrons and molecules can flow back and forth freely so that everybody can take advantage of the lowest cost sources of energy and the energy security that comes with that. But for me, the last couple of days is really all about the opportunity and the challenge that we all have to make sure that together we can realize that opportunity. Thank you, John. Um, you know, you talked about progress, and actually uh, the progress for this uh, region, for this block, has been tremendous. Um, ASEAN's economy is today the seventh largest economy if it was a country by itself. The population is the third largest population. Uh, it has been the fastest growing uh, right now and for a few years. It's also had some stability, uh, which is uh, really quite impressive and uh, very desirable. Um, growing consumer market, growing consumers and growing consumer um, uh, capacity. So in a way, quite powerful economic block and with huge potentials ahead. So maybe, um, what we could focus on now would be um, what do we feel is the, what would be your vision for ASEAN, um, you know, to really help it achieve its potential? And if I might ask the panelists, because we always talk about um, somebody doing something, but maybe I would like to ask each panelist on what you might do over the next 12 months or year, so when we come back and meet again at the next World Economic Forum meeting here in the region, what, would, uh, what kind of progress you might be able to demonstrate or share with us? So first, your broader vision, and second, 
what you might do over the next year. And I hope that that will also then serve as an inspiration for others in the audience. Please. Thank you very much. I think the vision uh, for the ASEAN countries uh, for the next decade or decades is to have really an integrated economy, which could be achieving the most uh, economic gains for its people. Now, the, the fundamental guarantee for realizing such a dream is what I'm very much impressed with, is the commitment of the leaders to building such an integrated economy. And uh, over the last couple of days, uh, I, I'm strongly uh, you know, uh, struck by the uh, consensus of the leaders about this dream. And I hope uh, this kind of consensus, the teamwork spirit, will be carried forward by the younger generation. I do believe uh, the future uh, for the ASEAN country is very bright. You have enjoyed fast growth, economic growth, and social progress over the last decades on the basis of political and economic stability. This is something you should maintain. And uh, I believe uh, in the digital world, there are lots of challenges. But I do believe uh, digital uh, technology would help uh, bring your economy to a high level. So this is my, your dream is also the dream of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. This is a multilateral institution. This is your bank. And we are committed to provide strong support financially or technically to the infrastructure development in your region. And uh, we are very much committed to be working with not just the government, but also the private sector. Uh, I would like to uh, encourage you to come to Jeju for the second annual meeting of AWIB from June the 26th to 18th. There will be lots of people, private sector people, uh, think tanks, as well as the government delegations. I hope we can continue our discussion here in Jeju. Thank you very much. So we hope to have a few active projects next year. Not just a few, quite a lot. <laughs> OK, that's great. We're going to be ambitious here. Um, you're in. So when I think about what I foresee the future of Southeast Asia should be like and could be like, a few words come to mind. Firstly, I would like us to be seen as a leader, a global leader, uh, a global leader and a global shaper. Right now, when we think about Southeast Asia, we think of ourselves as followers with huge opportunity and potential. In the future, I would like to see us fulfill that potential. I would like to see a day when global MNCs, when they're prioritizing which regions to start growing into, instead of looking at Southeast Asia as one of the last few on the bottom of the list, it's the very <clears throat> top. That, to me, is one of my big wishes. The other, from a more personal level, when you know, I, I used to study my undergrad and postgrad in England and the States, every time I hear someone ask, hey, where are you from? And when I hear myself respond and my fellow Southeast Asians respond, we usually say Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. We never say Southeast Asia. I would like the day when someone else were to ask the same generations or the younger generations, and we will equally say, hey, I'm Malaysian and I'm Southeast Asian. Right. Uh, so that's in terms of the vision, in terms of commitment of personally what I commit to do for the next year, and I said the next 50 as well. It's the same thing that my co-founder, Anthony, and I um, committed to doing when we started Grab, which is to help pave the way for Southeast Asia. We've been 100% focused on Southeast Asia. Every single day, people ask us to grow beyond, and we say, no, there's no need to it because we don't want to, and the opportunities here are humongous. Uh, and the way we're thinking of doing it is via technology and via reinvesting back into the talent pool here. 
So what I would like to do is to commit to continue doing that, to commit to continue listening and learning from all of our great leaders here, uh, and to commit working with our fellow government leaders on how we can shape the future. Because we know today is not good enough. We know what was done before is, should not define what was done in the future, what we should do in the future. So how do we look at that leapfrog future together, where we are the leader rather than the follower? Great. Wolfgang. Thanks. Well, my vision for the region is pretty simply the, the same that we all committed to two years ago when the, the nations of this world, civil society and the corporate sector, um, decided on the sustainable development goals and saying in progress and development, we will leave no one behind. And that's something that this region needs, and that's what we talk about when we mean inclusivity. My organization will commit to play our role, and um, I can mention two things that we're doing concretely, and we will scale up and roll out, and one is bridging the digital divide that is existing, particularly with regard to young women and girls in this region, and we have very exciting programs, but they require scale up. And the second commitment has to do with um, accountability that does come with the ambition to be inclusive. So social accountability has to reach the communities right at the grassroots. And um, we work with those communities and the governments, both here in Cambodia and in other places. And um, the social accountability that will be such a powerful tool to make sure that all these commitments that we have made don't stay rhetoric. And again, we will commit to working with governments and communities to do that. We will also hopefully benefit from digitization because at the moment this is pretty basic work. And for both those commitments, we could benefit a lot from getting some of you as partners. Thank you. Thank you. Kun Temin. Yes. Uh, my organization, uh, PTT, is the national oil company of Thailand. We are part of the uh, establishment called ASCO. ASEAN Cooperation on Petroleum, comprising of uh, 10 organizations representing the oil and gas for the respective member of ASEAN. So uh, what we'll do is to share the learning from this session, from the forum, and uh, emphasize the importance of connectivity uh, among the members of uh, ASCO. We will work on the, uh, the several projects that would allow the different members in ASEAN to be able to exchange uh, the flow of molecules and the flow of electrons cross-border so that we can have a, a better utilization of our infrastructure on energy together. Uh, that would be the first part. And the second part that we would be looking into is the technology development in order to, uh, to go towards the ideal energy that we are looking for, meaning that we have to work on the technology uh, on decarbonization on the decentralization of the infrastructure uh, construction, uh, looking into the, uh, there are several keywords here I have to look at. Look at. I think uh, uh, electrification, uh, turning fossil fuel into some of the electricity, and then uh, last but not least, which would also please my colleagues here, digitization uh, in part of the technology to help reduce our costs and improve our productivity. So those are the things that I'll be working with my colleagues in the uh, ASCO. And hopefully we'll have some progress to report next year. Thank you. John. So our, our collective aspiration for sustainable, inclusive growth uh, has many ingredients, but, but two principal ones are, are human capital and financial capital. The financial capital comes from AIIB, other institutions, and companies. So I can commit to continue our efforts to make sure that we're seeking every opportunity we can find to invest in the ASEAN regions and the countries and create the jobs that are required for sustainable, inclusive growth. With respect to human capital, it's not just the job creation. It's making sure that people are trained and equipped to do their job in the 21st century. We have capacity building programs underway in all of the ASEAN countries. 
we can expand those efforts and do more capacity building and training, and I will commit to ensure that we do that. <clears throat> Excellent. We have a very committed uh, panel uh, here, so I think that's really quite exciting. Um, it, it, in closing, I would just like to reflect back on what was said here. It does um, feel very strongly there's a high momentum, a lot of positivity, a lot of optimism, and really the potential for the region is substantial. Um, it, there's, there's huge opportunity to continue to drive prosperity uh, for the young, dynamic, and energetic population, um, who have, of course, embraced technological advancement already. Uh, but I really uh, uh, appreciated the comment that I think the youth needs to take responsibility as well, and responsibility for shaping that progress. Um, and then, of course, investment in infrastructure, but not just investment, but smart infrastructure. <clears throat> Transforming the education system, uh, a priority actually to equip the young people of the 20, uh, with 21st century jobs, ensuring that jobs, uh, we have more jobs for the growing youth, um, approaching projects with an intent to deliver social impact, um, ensuring gender equality in the technology access and inclusiveness elements. Um, I heard about borders being uh, connectors. I think that's a really good concept to ensure that the region can truly operate as one economic um, uh, uh, market. And uh, really that requires also uh, some level of consistency and the conversation around uh, creating that f around uh, regulators and policy making to ensure that you can have borders really be connectors. Um, the concept of big ambition uh, for inclusive growth, energy security, um, and then, of course, um, uh, driving, um, playing the region actually being a global leader and shaping the agenda, being in a leadership role, not just in a follower, follower mode. Um, given the fast pace of growth that the region has experienced, I think the region is very primed to be able to achieve that. Um, so the opportunity, in closing, I would say that tremendous future lies ahead for the region. Opportunities abound, harness the potential, and leapfrog ahead. I would like to thank all of you, the co-chairs here. You have been working very hard for the last few days, and really we are very grateful for your being such um, gracious ambassadors for the meeting, for the region, um, and for your commitment and leadership uh, in your engagement with the forum as well. So thank you very much for that. I would now like to... Um, I would now like to invite Philip Rossler, member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum, to come to the stage to share with us uh, the venue, the host country for the next summit. So... Dear Prime Minister Hun Sen, Prime Minister Fook, Prime Minister Sisulit, dear co-chairs, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The Work Nook Forum on ASEAN 2017 has unfortunately almost come to an end. But before we can come to an end, give me the opportunity to say thank you. Again, thank you to our excellent co-chairs. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you, Sarita, for great moderation. And also thank you to the team of the World Economic Forum and all our friends for hardworking time, for a great run-up, for great sessions, and for sleepless night. And thank you to our regional director, Justin Wood. <laughs> and they could only hard work because of truly great host, Excellency Prime Minister Samdech Tech Hun Sen, and your entire team. Thank you very much for great hospitality. Thank you very much to the Kingdom of Cambodia. And allow me now to ask you to join me on stage to say a few words of farewell, and then I will announce the next host for 2018. But first, I would like to invite His Excellency Prime Minister Hun Sen.
Thank you, Philip Roster. Excellencies, Prime Minister Nguyen Xuân Phúc. Excellency, Prime Minister Tong Lun Sisulit. Excellencies, Madam, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Lee Philip uh, talked already that the World Economic Forum on ASEAN come to an end with uh, the success that we all together created. And this also show the harmonization in the framework of ASEAN. And that is the big uh, energy of the region. I am very pleased with the invitation, with the participation from friends that come to the capital of Phnom Penh of the Kingdom of Cambodia in order to take part with us. And this show that at this time we have been working as a team in the framework of ASEAN as well as in the preparation with the participation from all the participants in this uh, big uh, forum. And I hope that uh, this World Economic Forum will become an important forum in order to obstruct the policies of protectionism and will also uh, increase the spirit of integration as well as uh, globalization. Thank you. F to all participants who have been trying hard and provide, uh, giving the honors to Cambodia to be the host. My best wishes to Excellencies, Madam, Lady and Gentlemen, I mean happiness and progress. Thank you. Please remain on stage. Remain on stage. Go to the call. And it's now my own and pleasure to announce that the next ASEAN Summit 2018 will go to Vietnam. And therefore, I would like to join, ask to join Prime Minister Phuc. xin mời thủ tướng Hun Sen sẽ là trao chuông cho thủ tướng Nguyễn Xuân Phúc. Prime Minister Phúc. Excellency Prime Minister Hun Sen, Prime Minister Sulith, Mr. Philip Rosler, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to extend my warmest congratulations to, to the host of WEF ASEAN 2017. I believe you have had a very successful forum with many address, many inputs that help ASEAN proceed further in economics. Vietnam in 2010 already hosted the WEF ASEAN and we have learned some experience from hosting such an event. And today in the Cambodia, in the Kingdom of Cambodia, WEF ASEAN 2017 has been a success. It is a privilege for us to host WEF ASEAN 2018. This is a testament to the strong partnership between Vietnam and WEF, 
as well as between Vietnam and the international business community. I am convinced that with the support and close cooperation of WEF, governments and the international business community, WEF ASEAN 2018 in Vietnam will be a success, contributing greatly to pushing dialogues and the PPP for a peaceful and stable region and for dynamic and sustainable development of the region. Once again, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Prime Minister Hun Sen, the royal government, and people of Cambodia, Mr. Philip and his team, as well as all of you, for your support for Vietnam. And especially thanks to uh, Prime Minister of Laos, our dear friend, who has been with us since the beginning. I am looking forward to welcoming Prime Minister Hun Sen, Prime Minister Sin Sulit, and other leaders of ASEAN, uh, and Mr. Philip, to the WEF ASEAN 2018 in Vietnam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your remarks. The World Economic Forum really looks forward to hosting the 2018 Summit on ASEAN in Vietnam. Um, ladies and gentlemen, maybe I can ask you to one more time thank our co-chairs who have been patiently sitting here for their contributions for the last few days. I now officially declare the 2017 World Economic Forum on ASEAN meeting closed. We look forward to welcoming all of you next year in Vietnam. Thank you.